Hi, everyone, and welcome to my podcast, Perfect Prey. I'm glad you're here. My name is Dr. Christine Marie Cochola, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and have a doctorate in clinical social welfare, where I research course of control and the impact on both adult and child victims. Most importantly, I am a survivor and a protective parent. Victims and survivors of course of control are never to blame. But I chose the name Perfect Prey because course of controllers who are individuals who apparently have characterologically disordered personalities do choose who to prey upon. They choose people who tend to be agreeable and conscientious, perhaps loyal to a fault, fixers, optimistic, and empathic. Or these course of controllers prey upon those who are most vulnerable including our children. It's part of their plan to gain control. How do we help our children when they're experiencing systematic, unacknowledged child abuse? We need to understand how these course of controllers, harmful individuals, attempt to exert their power over us and our children. We need to look beyond a trauma-informed lens, but also layer it with a course of control lens. So, Let's engage in personal power conversations that will create the protective parts that will derail the course of controller from his plan. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our podcast, Perfect Prey. I am so excited. Today, we have Alexa with us, and she is going to be sharing her experiences as a child growing up in a home with a course of controller narcissistic abuser. As you know, I'm trying to really spread the word and create more awareness so that children have an understanding of what they've experienced, but also so their parents understand what the children are experiencing in these homes. So, Alexa, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming onto the show. Thank you for having me. It's exciting because it's going to be like healing and therapeutic, so... I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah, thank you. And I should say that, you know, and I do have a trigger warning before the podcast, but for some people, this can be really overwhelming and stressful, and please make sure you engage in self-care. So I think what I like to start with when I talk to young people, and you certainly are a younger person, please tell our listeners a little bit about what your childhood experiences were like living in that world with, this was your stepfather, Mm -hmm. and it was someone that you know, you met him when you were four and he came into your family system. Do you remember it for having an immediate feeling or a discomfort or was it slow over time? Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I don't think that I ever had an immediate feeling or anything. I think because I was so young and I just kind of grew up with it, it was never like, oh my gosh, like it was never just an immediate thing. It it was just my life. That was just normal. So not that it's normal. But it felt normal, right? Okay. All right. It's not normal, but it's, and my mom, we were having a conversation and she worded it perfectly that it's not normal and you know, it's not normal, but you normalize it to survive because you're otherwise you're not going to survive. You're not going to get through it. So So that's so perfectly said because children learn, right? Exactly what they need to do to ensure that there either is equilibrium in the home, like that you personally as a child don't do anything to make the Mm -hmm. perpetrator angry or be upset either with your parent that you're worried about or yourself, right? But you also do a lot of people pleasing for that abuser because if you don't please that abuser in some way, you know that something perhaps can happen that won't be comfortable that that resonates with you. Yeah. It was always looking back now. I didn't know it then, but as an adult looking back now, I was always, always, always on fight or flight. And that's so exhausting. Even like looking back, that's just such an exhausting thing to live through is just fight or flight all the time. You never know what's going to trigger to make him mad or, you know, what's not going to make him mad. Like now as an adult, I wake up and I'm fine. I'm relaxed as a kid and and a young adult growing up in that home. You never know what the day is going to bring. So you're always just stressed. Like it's always like you're always tensed and curled up and not literally curled up, but it just kind of, that's the best way I can describe how it felt. Yeah. I think before we got on the call, you mentioned eggshells. So like Mm -hmm. you're constantly as a child, you're learning 
that that's the only way to actually function in life is to be walking on eggshells all of the time. And it just becomes like normal. So your brain is always in this hypervigilant state Mm -hmm. and you're learning to regulate your behaviors around everyone else. So you can't actually, I mean, it's hard for children to relax in these situations, like to just be themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was your relationship like with this person? I mean, he's your stepdad. Mm -hmm. He's someone that your mom loves and, you know, he's part of your family. There's other children in the family system Mm -hmm. also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, for, you know, the first four years, it, it was just me and my other sibling. Yeah. So my siblings, I always felt, and my mom, I always felt, I don't know why I felt this way. I always felt like I had to protect all of them and, you know, make sure, I mean, between all of the siblings, I was the one that faced the most lash outs and abuse and consequences. So I always felt the need to protect them. My relationship, and this literally was an aha moment last night because I was thinking about this. He always told me we're the most similar and that's why our personalities clash so much. But when I was thinking about it, I'm not similar to him at all, at all. I was the most vocal and the most strong-minded, strong-willed that narcissists don't like that. They don't like people that stand up to them. They want people to cower down to them. So I always thought, man, I'm so similar to him. You know, maybe that's why we clash so much, but we're, we also have this weird bond, this closeness, but really it was just, I stood up to him and maybe he kept me close because I did stand up to him and maybe we didn't have a close relationship, but he kept me close to kind of control me. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. And I would almost, so if we can put that a little bit more in context, that's a really great way to say it, that you were strong-willed. I think what we know from research is some children are born more ego resilient. And some children are just born, just no fault of their own, a little more ego compromised. And it sounds like you were born more ego resilient. Here you are in this family system where there's trauma going on. It's actively occurring in your life, but you're still that feisty, like, nope, you're Mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, and you started the, the statement by saying you were the protector. So you have a sibling. When he came into your life, you and that sibling were sharing, were in the family, but then your mother had a, another child with him, right? So there was a total of three of you or with, yes. And so, you know, it makes sense that if you're a little more resilient in the way that you are, evidently, <laughs> that he is going to keep you like under like more close watch because you're the one he has to watch out for more, right? Yeah. It's actually a trigger that I didn't, I don't know if this makes sense, but my husband and I were out with our, with our baby. He's going to be two in July. And this guy, he was grabbing a glass and he wasn't squeezing or anything. It broke in his hand just randomly. And I was coming out of the bathroom with my baby when it happened. And I saw the blood on the floor and I guess reverting back to my childhood, my, he was kind of, you know, being a baby and I was trying to quiet him because I was scared of the backlash of this total stranger. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, I knew when there was something bad going on with my stepfather that if we made a noise or anything that there would be backlash on us. So it was weird. It was just like, I don't know, mind blowing that that happened. It was a trigger. I didn't know I had that trigger and it's just crazy to me. I think it just reminds me of that when we talk about like the reptilian mode of our brain, like that lower functioning mode for you in that moment when you saw that event happen last evening, it was a moment of, I'm not safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do I make myself as safe as possible? And as a child, you grew up in a home where you never really truly felt authentically safe. And it's not surprising to me that you're going to have these moments in your life. And what's really great is that you're able to have that moment and say, oh, I know why I had this moment now, you know, versus I think what happens to some people is they never actually unpack all of it. Mm -hmm. And that causes more, well, it causes intergenerational trauma, right? Mm -hmm. We don't end up being as healthy as we can actually be. That's what the abuser, of course, is hoping, Mm -hmm. right? Is that we don't actually have that resiliency and that ability to overcome challenging circumstances. So good for you for noticing that. (laughs) thing. But and you asked me about my relationship with my mom. Sorry to go back. My mom didn't grow up with the most good examples of men and she was looking for love and men in the wrong places. So 
she was never abusive towards me. And I feel like she was a victim too. And she had me when she was very young. She was a teenager. And so I can't imagine having my son when I was her age. So having to grow up and raise a kid. And I just don't think she had the correct wisdom. So I never blamed her for anything. I always question why, why us, like why us in this situation. But I'm very, very close to my mom. Like I call her for the most inconvenient things in my life. If I didn't have enough ice in my Coke, I'm going to call her. <laughs> So we're very close. I'm very, very protective over her to this day. Like I will punch somebody in the throat for my mom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that like need to like protect us is still there, right? Yeah. Over all my family. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I love that you guys are close and that you were able to see that her, she was trapped in this relationship. And as a result of that, you guys were trapped. But I think historically, we've never been taught, I mean, frankly, the green flags in a relationship. What are the signs a relationship's healthy? You know, we could talk about red flags too, but really, how come we don't talk about what makes a relationship dynamic a really healthy, good one? You know, and certainly generations ago, we were not taught that. So it's not surprising that a lot of people don't know what those are. So was his abuse more, it sounds like you were frightened of him, but Mm -hmm. you powered through, but would you say his abuse was more over, like with violence and, and threats and screaming and yelling? And what about the covert abuse? Because that's the abuse that is, it's always there. So covert abuse is always there, but it's not acknowledged oftentimes. And a lot of times we don't even know we're being abused in that way until we unpack it a little bit. So Yeah, I mean, I feel like it was more comments towards my mom, because there would be comments about her weight or, you know, just little things that it would anger me inside because I feel like, you know, you shouldn't talk about anybody, let alone your wife in that way. Maybe I don't know if it was abuse, but, you know, I lived at home up until I was a young, early in my 20s. And he would go, I would have to leave my phone on the kitchen counter every night. And it would be gone through, not by my mom. My mom trusted me, but it's almost like was looking. It's not like a normal parent where they're like, you know, let me make sure you're staying out of trouble, not doing anything you shouldn't be. It was more of, let me see what I can find so I can find something to be angry at you about. Or, you know, I don't know. And I don't know if because of his life didn't turn out how he wanted to, that maybe I'm not trying to talk good about myself or anything, but maybe he was jealous of me because I excelled in school and. I had different talents, different things that I was good at. And I don't know if he saw that I have potential and he was jealous and he had to beat me down anytime he could. So I don't know if that's considered abuse, but. It certainly is. So like anytime that somebody diminishes you or tries to degrade you in some way and to not allow you to be free to be yourself. And it sounds to me like what he was doing, if you were in your early 20s, that's an invasion of privacy. I mean, that's another way to exert power and control over you. Uh, You know, how many times do we hear about this with abusers? They say, oh, I'm just so worried about you. That's why I keep texting you while you're out. Or, I mean, it's almost like he was doing that with you in the home. It's like he would tell me he didn't want me to turn out like he did. And I knew I wasn't going to, you know, I, in my early 20s, I didn't have a baby as a teenager. I was in school. Like I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. Like it went as far. I moved out when I was 22. What it boiled down to was I knew someone who was in med school who wanted to go on a date with me. I'm 22. I feel like I should just be able to go on a date. And he wanted to meet this guy before we went on a date. And this guy is also an adult. He's like, that's weird. I'm not doing that. And so it became a huge argument. And one thing led to the other. And I wound up moving out. My mom, you know, was helping me look for places to live. Not that she wants me to leave, but I think it was almost her way of helping me escape. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So she saw it happening too. So did she end up leaving him? Yeah. Very, very within the last year. Very soon. Okay. It takes a long time to escape these relationships. People like you and Dr. Amani, and she's in a group called Conquer. And if it weren't for all these other women, she would have never gotten that strength and be where she's at today. No, it's true. It sounds to me like you showed her some strength too. I hope so. It seems like it. Yeah. So I'm grateful that you got out and you escaped. I mean, really, this is what they do is they literally try to trap people in in the home or just in the relationship itself. The abuse happens oftentimes in the relationship, but it also happens outside of the relationship. Like they they try to pull you back in and everything. And I know that he was your stepdad, but 
Can you tell me a little bit more about maybe how it felt to be a child growing up in that home or even some of your sibling experiences about what it felt to be a child growing up in a home with someone who was exerting so much power and control over them? It's hard, but you don't realize it's hard. You're just trying to survive. But coming home, you never know if your parents are to be arguing or what you're going to do that's going to set them off. And is he going to physically hurt you? Or is he going to break stuff that's important to you? Because there's been times when I would see him starting to get riled up, I would go and hide things that were important to me that I didn't want to get broken. So it's very stressful. Looking back in fifth grade, I had anxiety. That's when I know for sure, without a doubt, I had anxiety because I would wake up in the middle of the night feeling like I was going to die. And for whatever reason, my fifth grade mind going to the bathroom and drinking water would help me not die. (laughs) But I just, I know I had anxiety and I was grinding my teeth at night. And so it's just, it's stressful. You don't know it's stressful, but you kind of do, but it's scary. And you wish you could have like a normal childhood, like other kids and you see their parents being loving. And of course, on the outside around other people, they're loving, but then behind closed doors, you're constantly scared. Like you don't want people to leave when you have visitors because you know, you're safe then because they're not going to act out then unless it's their own parents or siblings. So it's just scary. And you don't ever want that for anybody, especially when you have your own kids. Like there's little things that I'm very, very self-conscious about how I react to my baby and how I treat him and things like, as well as like grabbing my arm. One time someone did that and that triggered me and I started tearing up. I didn't mean to start tearing up, but I did. So I'm very conscious. Like I try not to grab him by the arm. So I try to keep him as far away from the child that I experienced as possible. Right. I know I'm not abusive to him and he's the coolest kid. And I look at him and I'm like, man, I wish that I had yeah. a husband that loved each other. We love that kid so much. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. There's nothing like having your own little one, right? And wanting so much to protect them from everything that you've experienced that was painful. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the process is actually acknowledging how bad it was. Right. And the trauma you experience so that you don't, you know, creating that in your own life, which is just a beautiful thing, really. I don't think I realized, like, you would hear stories about child abuse, but picture these kids, like, with black eyes and in the hospital. And that was never me. So it was not until I was older that I was like, oh my God, I was a kid of child abuse. So you I think you don't realize a lot until you're an adult. And maybe some adults don't because they, they don't have the right resources, but. It's just why. It is. It is. And our family courts don't recognize it. And they think children, oh, maybe they witnessed abuse. But that's, first of all, there's no such thing as witnessing abuse because if you're around it, you feel it. Mm -hmm. It's in our bodies. It becomes a part of our DNA, this feeling of hypervigilance. And that anxiety you referenced in fifth grade is like such a telltale sign for children who are experiencing these types of abuses. And I think it's different, right? Like if you had gone to school, and you had a bruise and somebody said, oh my gosh, Alexa's being abused and let's get interventions in her house and let's get her mother out of there. And, and your mom may have left a lot sooner and all of these other things. But when nobody can name it and you can't name it and you know the adult victim is living in her own trauma, she's not able to name it. Like That's when it becomes this space of just isolation. It's almost like when they do these covert abuses that no one can name, they are able to hide in plain sight. And it creates a lot of tension and anxiety in children. We see it all the time. Yeah. And I do remember in middle school, we had an assignment and it was like, write something you wish you had or hadn't done or happened or something. I don't remember what it was. And I said, I wish so-and-so did not do this. Well, it was something abusive. And so my teacher had to report it. And so that was the first time. And I was terrified. I don't know how much I'm allowed to say or not say because I don't know if it'll cause recognition or whatever, but my real father, who I have a good relationship with, he's a police officer. However, due to this situation, I was scared of police officers coming. And at that time, there was an investigation and another one of that person's family members took me somewhere and talked to me about it. And I don't remember the exact conversation. All I know is that after that conversation, I said that, you know, it was an accident. I didn't mean to write that. Not true. And the investigation was cut off. And this person denies that and and said, you were basically 
you could have said whatever you wanted to say. I didn't force you to say anything, but it just doesn't make sense that 12-year-old girl would flip the switch. I mean, it was an active investigation. There should have never been that conversation in, in the first place. But the first time that I think I ever told anybody or and I didn't tell anybody until I was an adult because I was so scared. So I want our listeners, anybody who's a younger person listening to hear that, right? That sometimes victims and survivors retract what has actually happened out of fear, right? And that abusers will often blame victims. It's called Darvo, right? So he like denied any wrongdoing, attacks, and then reverses victim and offender. So it's easier for a person to back down and say, okay, okay, you're right. That didn't happen. Because of course, there's the fear of retaliation. There's the fear of rejection. There's a fear of what's going to happen to your mother. There's a fear you might lose housing. There's a fear that, I mean, there's just so many fears embedded in all of that. And in the moment that a child retracts, sadly, the system just says, okay, case closed. When actually, why did a child say that? And, you know, I always say that kids don't lie to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Like they just don't, you know, And if they say something and they retract it, we have to ask why they said it and why they would retract it. What are the reasons? Why? You were worried about your safety, your family's safety. I didn't know if he went to jail, my mom's a stay-at-home mom, what are we to do? You know, I know my dad will take me and my sibling in. What about my mom and my other sibling? And to this day, he still denies that. Like my mom to this, we were an adult. I was an adult when I told my mom, no, this is what actually happened because she wasn't there when it happened. So, Well, what would you say to a young listener who maybe is like wondering if like, what would you say to give them like context about whether or not they're being abused? And also what would you say to give them hope? I think if something doesn't feel normal or look normal, it's not normal. If you have to ask why or, or is it, it's not, you know, the person you should feel the most safe around as a child is your parent or whoever's, you know, your caretaker, you shouldn't fear them or have to walk on eggshells around them. You should feel the most comfortable around them and not um, scared to talk to them about things or be scared to be made fun of for something that you've said or for it to be used against you in the future. And as far as giving hope, I mean, there are people out there that care and there are resources to help you. You just have to find those resources and heal. And, you know, because as an adult, it'll affect you. It affects me to this day. I'm a people pleaser. I'm very, very hyper aware of other people's emotions and it tenses me up. And if you don't get a handle on it, it's going to be very hard to get through your day to day. So when I moved out, it, it was just such a normal life. And I almost had the survivor's guilt because my mom was still left behind. My siblings were left behind, but you realize what a normal life, if you're with the right person, obviously you realize what a normal life is and you can get there. You know what? You said something really important that I'd like to make sure that our listeners hear. And that is that if you leave, you actually show other people there is a path to leaving. So I understand the survivor's guilt and that is such a valid concern, but sometimes stepping out of the system, the family system where all of this is going on shows other people in the family system oh, we can do this. This is possible. There is a way out. Yeah. Yeah, And it sounds like you were able to show that even if it took a little extra time for your mom, but you were able to show your family how to do that. And even after I moved out, I mean, there was still that little bit of control and slowly I started to stand up to it. I'm like, that's not normal. (laughs) We're not doing that. This is not your show. This is my family. I have my own family. This is how we're going to live our life. And you're not going to control how we live our life. And if you don't like that, then you you don't have to be a part of the family. Just I saw something that said, just because someone is a family member, if they're toxic, you don't have to have them around. And I feel like it's so important for people to know because this person made it seem like family is everything. You have to be around family and family is top priority. And sometimes family members are toxic and you have to for you to have a normal life and for you to survive and for you to move on, you have to you know, cut that toxic part out, you know? Absolutely. So well said. Just because someone's a relative doesn't mean that we have to have them be a part of our life. And that's a little, that's very tricky, especially when it's a biological parent. It can be extremely tricky for children and children need to know it's okay. There's no guilt in that because if that person were a stranger, you wouldn't have a relationship with them. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, thank you so much, Alexa, for your time. I appreciate it. And I appreciate your willingness to come on to Perfect Prey and share with people the experiences of children who I believe are the perfect prey for these abusers. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Perfect Prey. You can find the show on my website at iknowyourheart.com or courseofcontrolconsulting.com or subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts. I'd love your feedback and I'm always looking for ideas on how to continue to expose course control as the significant harm and child abuse that it is. The best way to support the show is to rate and review Perfect Prey on Apple Podcasts. It helps others to find us. Perfect Prey is written by me, Dr. Christine Cocciola, and with the help of my amazing assistant, Sheena Pastor. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.